Thank you all for being here. Well, I know I stand up here before you, but I'm a lot like you. I was raised with cats and dogs as a kid, and I had this blind cat that used to ride around on my shoulder. And I know it's an East Coast thing to say, but uh, I would take her out in the backyard and watch her roam around and navigate her environment uh, blind while the other kids were playing stickball. And um, I watched her day after day. Sometimes she would just sleep. I learned a lot from her. I might have been her eyes, but she was my everything else. She's never far behind. And I want to tell you about some of the small cats that we're working on now. Okay, here, this is a tigrina. Well, here are some of the cats we work on. And I know all of you think that we actually get to handle all the cats. That's not so. Um, here's what we do. We work with our colleagues all around the world to address the conservation issues associated with these small cats and their disappearing habitats. Here are some of my colleagues, Ashan Tadugula, who was here two years ago, near a street sign that now we're seeing people take selfies of, uh, warning uh, motors of fishing cats. My colleague, Anya Barshkova, in Russia, working on Manul. And here's my colleague, Constanza Napolitano, in Chile, with a Wienia, the cat that I studied for my PhD. We actually have three approaches. First, we work with the species where we can. We work with their habitats, so that's the wildlands. And we work with something we call guardians, which are the people in country working every day to address the threats that these cats face. I work only with in-country partners around the world who live in their home country and want to work on these small cats. So that's, that's the basis of what I do. I don't like to go there and tell them what to do. I help them to do what they do. Well, here I am with three of those cats, but very rarely do we get to actually handle the cats. Here's a flat-headed cat from Thailand and a Wienia, and the Andean cat that we captured in Bolivia. With wild lands, well, here's a place that illustrates what I'm talking about. This is in the, on the Panama-Costa Rica border, and there are six species of wild cats that live here in Le Amistad uh, International Park. Now, the, the parks there are not what we think of as national parks. There are no headquarters. There's uh, no real guard staff, and, and we, we have to beef up those areas to protect these cats and other species that live there. It turns out that there's no other place like this north of the equator in the Americas that has so many species of cats. So this is one of those places around the world that's a cat hotspot that we want to protect. And there are several others around the world that, that are, have high concentrations of cats that we want to protect. Here's some of our guardians that I spoke about. Remember species, wild lands, and guardians. Here are, here are um, some of the guardians that we have. And there's Anya Ratniyaku, who I'll introduce later. We had the first international small cat summit just a few weeks ago in the UK, where we brought 20 people working on small cats from around the world to actually meet each other for the first time. Now, what, what you have to realize is that the small cats don't have uh, a lot of people working on them. Many people are one ofs. So in the country where they're working, they're the only one that's working on that species. Their colleagues are often far away. They've never met them. They only correspond with them on email. And so this is our first meeting where we got together where we could all meet each other. Uh, we had to uh, bring our sleeping bags because we couldn't afford the linen service. And we had to double up in, in pods uh, every night. We form species working groups. So here's an example of the Manul working group. Uh, my colleagues from uh, Russia uh, to Uzbekistan, Mongolia, working together to save Manul across its range. 
Here's Ashan working with fishing cats in uh, Sri Lanka, and there's our sign. We actually have our own rehab center. Our problem there is that we have road strikes that kill and injure fishing cats. The injured ones we can help, but we needed a place to put them. There's no such place. We had to build our own. So this is our rehab center, and you can see two happy fishing cats there sitting at the top of the waterfall. Both were males. We were told by my colleague that we shouldn't put two males in the same cage, but we had done that before we, uh, without knowing uh, that they would get along fine. He suggested we should build two nest boxes, one for each male, and you can guess what happened. They both ended up in the same nest box. <laughs> so we learned something about these cats every day. Here's Alvaro um, working on the pompous cat in, in Peru. He's the only one in the world working on pompous cats. It occurs in, in, uh, in Chile, uh, Bolivia, Argentina, Peru, Brazil, but he's the only one working on it in, in, uh, in it anywhere. He works in Peru. Here's my colleague, Anya Barshkova. We're setting some camera traps in Kazakhstan. And here we're just trying to find out, well, are there any in this particular area in Kazakhstan because nobody's looked. So she's doing the first studies anywhere in these places where we, are, we have big holes in our knowledge that we don't know if the cat exists at all or not. This is typical uh, habitat that we visited together and set camera traps on the Russia-Mongolian uh, uh, border. So this would be prime habitat for Manul. It doesn't look like there are any threats, right? But what you don't see is the, is the herds of goats that people are raising and the, the, um, how the habitat is changing due to grazing. This is the kind of field condition she works in. Uh, the picture on the right is 40 below zero. This is at a temperature when alcohol freezes and the Manul is out there walking around, and so is Anya. She said that, well, she lives in Siberia. She was raised in Siberia. And she said, we're not the ones with the thickest blood. We're the ones with the warmest clothes. <laughs> and I, I was there. I, I believe it. When I'm visiting these places, we often do interviews. It turns out that uh, the further I travel, the more important I become. So I'm being asked, I'm being asked questions in Russian. I talk to my colleague Masha there, we talk about the weather, we talk about something, and then she answers the question in Russian knowing how, how to answer the question. I don't answer the question, she answers the question. But the way we get that interview is, I show up. Okay. And we do that all over the world. So we use my visits to the best advantage. Often these young people can't get in to see government government, important government people that we have to talk to, but if I travel that far, the door is open, and then my colleagues, my young colleagues, can say what they have to say. So I open the door, but they do the talking. Here's Murti Kantamahanti. He's working on fishing cats in, in India. And again, we reduce the threats. What's the threat, and what do we have to do to get rid of it? Here, Murthy is uh, lecturing a group, um, preaching the gospel on fishing cats, educating, increasing awareness. Murthy was able to stop an illegal road through a sanctuary uh, by organizing a bunch of conservation groups and then uh, forcing the court to order the road stopped. That's what we do. What's the threat? The road going through a sanctuary. How do we stop it in the courts? Tiasa Adhaya, well, she's the only person I know that received an award from the Prime Minister of India. He shook her hand for her conservation work. An amazing achievement when you consider that the population in India is over a billion people, that she would receive, I, I have never received a handshake from a president, and I don't know many people that have, but she did. And it's all because of her conservation work on behalf of fishing cats in West Bengal. All the time, left and right, raising awareness, in the newspaper, on TV, that's what she does. She's, and she's terrific at it. But again, 
They're one ofs. It's not an organization, it's a person. My task is to find that person and enable them. And that's what my donors help me do. Now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Anya Ratnayaka, working on fishing cats in Sri Lanka, and I know you're gonna find her story fascinating. I'll turn it over to my colleague. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I assure you, it's not that cold in Sri Lanka. I was in Nepal, that's why I'm wearing that jumper. <laughs> um, okay, so today I'm gonna talk, tell you all the story about Colombo's friendly backyard beast, as I like to call them. For those of you who have never had the pleasure of meeting a fishing cat, I brought Oya along with me. Um, as you can see, fishing cats look very much like leopards, but they have one very unique feature. <laughs> they quack like ducks. So, yeah, so my lovely muscular animal quacks like a duck. Um, so, the fishing cat is a vulnerable species globally, but locally they are still an endangered um, species. They are heavily associated with water-rich habitats, and as their name suggests, they are very, very good at catching fish. Now, I work in um, Colombo, Sri Lanka, and for those of you who don't know where that is, um, it is, where is my laser point? Right there. It's the capital city of the country, and like all capital cities, or most capital cities around the world, it's extremely congested due to um, heavy urbanization. The city itself has an area of around 37 um, square kilometers, but it has a very unique feature, and that is its urban wetlands. Now, the urban wetlands themselves cover about 15% of the city, um, and they are also home to 277 species of fauna and 252 species of flora, most of which are threatened or endemic. Um, so the civil war in Sri Lanka ended in 2009, um, and with it came a heavy wave of um, urbanization and city beautification. Um, so the government started clearing wetlands. Wetlands at the time were poorly understood habitats, and they obviously were the, on the top of the list of things that needed to go. So this is an example of a wetland that we had. It's uh, called the Bellang Villa Arctidia Sanctuary. This photograph is taken in 2012, and this is what it looks like now. So as you can see, there's a very large open body of water which was created for flood control purposes, and there's a lovely little jogging path around it for the residents in the area to do their morning exercise and yoga and whatnot. So in 2012, I ended up, um, I graduated and I came back home, and like most young Sri Lankans, I wanted to work with the leopard. But I heard about these wetlands, and I knew that there were fishing cats in these wetlands, and I wanted to know how this wetland habitat specialist was handling all the wetland destruction. So this is that uh, wetland I showed you previously from ground level. Um, so my team and I, and our trusty off-road blue trishaw, uh, went around um, Colombo selecting certain wetlands, and we started setting up camera traps. It took us a couple of months to iron out the kinks because, I mean, we were starting brand new. We didn't, know what, we didn't really know what we were doing. Um, so it took us a couple of months to get used to everything. Um, and then we started getting our cats. This particular cat's name is Ryujin, and he was notorious for, um, for the lack of a better word, pooping in front of our cameras. Um, <laughs> And um, after he pooped, he would often smell his creations. He was very proud of them. Um, <laughs> and of course, I enjoyed it because to me, finding poop in the field is one of the most exciting things in the world. So I've got, like, I've got poop in my fridge, don't tell my parents or my husband. Um, it's nicely hidden behind uh, <laughs> things in the fridge. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is Ghost. Um, he took us eight months to get this cat on camera. 
Um, so I was very excited when I finally got him. So once we've got our once we had our cats on camera, we moved on to capturing them. As you can see, very happy cat. And um, we tranquilized them and we collared them. Um, so we cover their faces so that they don't get stressed out. Um, so next, we did what we did was we released our cats and we tracked them for six months. This cat's name is Vadua. He was a big old male, lots of battle scars on his face, um, torn ears. I don't know if you all can see that, but he's got a nice rip up there. Um, and we tracked, uh, so he was released in the Sri Jayavadanapura wetland sanctuary. And this is a high security zone um, wetland because the parliament is right there. So there's a lot of security around. This is his movement for six months. Um, he used the wetlands very well. Um, he also moved along the borders of these wetlands. Um, so it was very interesting mo uh, movement data. We had never had this data before, so it was quite unique. And so the next cat, I know I'm not supposed to have favorites. It's like all parents. They always say that they don't have a favorite child, but from experience, I know that they do have a favorite child, and that's my younger brother. Um, <laughs> um, so my favorite child is this cat, and this is why. So his name is Mizuchi, um, and he was actually found in the middle of the city by accident. Um, this particular house in a very busy um, part of Colombo, Colombo 5, for any of you all who want to Google it, um, the landlord had built this outdoor pond and filled this pond with goldfish. And these goldfish at the time were about $2 or maybe $3. Goldfish started going missing. Nobody cared. It was $3, not that much. Then he graduated to Japanese koi. I don't know how many fish connoisseurs are here, but Japanese koi can go to about $100 a fish. These fish started going missing, and of course, alarm bells rang in his head, so he set up security cameras to catch the culprit. This is the culprit. Um, he's a gorgeous one-and-a-half-year-old cat. Um, we have three months of footage of him catching fish. Um, we have some footage of him just sitting in the pond like a child in a kiddie pool and just turning around in circles because he's trying to catch these fish. Um, and he's not the only one. There was another one that walked out of um, view when he comes down the wall. <laughs> he's very patient. He's a lovely boy. So that's $100 right there. <laughs> um, <laughs> this particular night, I believe he took five fish. That's 500 bucks. Um, luckily for us, the landlord loved cats. So <laughs> that worked in our favor. Um, so we collared Mizuchi, and um, this is his home range, or rather, this is where he was found. This is his area. He was found up there. Um, and as you can see, there's no wetland anywhere. His movement pattern looked like this. Up here is an abandoned house. That was his kind of hub. Um, it was very stinky. Fishing cats smell really bad. Um, but I like it, because that's the only way I know that the cats are around. So I, I actively go sniffing like a sniffer dog, and people think I'm mad when they're walking be, uh, around me. Um, this right here is actually a cinema which um, Mizuchi visited during the um, opening of the Monkey Kingdom. Unfortunately, I couldn't ask him what he thought about it, um, because I didn't bump into him after that. Um, so yeah, so now we've got our science in order, so we wanted to start the conservation side of the project, and that meant um, awareness. So we started a, a website for the project, so it explains what we do and the species. Um, we also sell t-shirts on and off, so many of you have bought our t-shirts, so thank you. This is actually Neville Buck um, from the Port Lymph Wild Animal Park in London, and that's Nariani, the cat, one of the cats under his care. 
Um, we have multiple awareness programs for kids, um, and many of them try and steal my, um, my animals. Um, so I have to run behind them when they're getting into their cars with their parents to try and retrieve them. We also have awareness programs for university students, and we try our very best to take all these groups into the wetland so that they are fully immersed in what we're trying to teach them rather than have them in a classroom. So we take them out, we show them how to track, we show them what we do with our camera traps, what we do with our um, trap cages, we show them my wonderful jars of poop so that they, they can be fully immersed in it. Um, <laughs> so apart from um, our awareness, we also rescue kittens. So we've actually got the public calling us and the wildlife department, of course, um, when they've got um, kittens. This little girl was about half the size of this guy over here. She was 90 grams, and she was found in this location. So again, no wetland. It's a very urbanized um, neighborhood-type area. Apart from the fishing cats, we do get... Does anyone know what this is? It's like, yes, it's Pooh Bear. But what's on Pooh Bear? <laughs> so that's actually a rusty spotted cat. It's the smallest species in the world. Um, so when I got this little girl, she was 70 grams, and she was the size of this guy's head. So I could fit her in my palm. Um, she was a gorgeous little girl. Um, so then... We also do wetland conservation, because I mentioned earlier, wetlands are poorly understood um, habitats. So we work very closely with the government, in particular the Sri Lanka Land Reclamation and Development Corporation. That's a mouthful, so I will start calling it the SLRDC from now on. Um, and the SLRDC, along with the Urban Development Authority, the World Bank, and several um, foreign consultants have created the wetland management strategy in Sri Lanka. So they're trying to sustainably use and manage these wetlands now, because everyone's realizing how important these habitats are. Um, so with this wetland management strategy, they've started to rehabilitate um, and rebuild wetlands that were previously devastated or cleared. Um, they have also created two wetland parks from scratch to let the public walk in. So it's kind of like the Everglades um, uh, layout. So there are lots of uh, overhead uh, bridges for people to walk over. We've got um, these walkways. We've also got, uh, we allow people to use the boats and go for boat rides and, you know, get, be fully immersed in these wetlands and start to appreciate them. We also have several notice boards around the wetlands uh, displaying the wetland wildlife, in particular the fishing cat. All these boards are in all the, the three languages in Sri Lanka, that's Sinhala, Tamil, and English. Um, and also, I'm very proud to say that um, Colombo has actually applied to the Ramsar Convention to for wetland city accreditation. So if we get it, that means we will be one of the few countries in the world known as a Ramsar city. Um, so that means we will be promoting wetland conservation, we will be promoting the, um, the beauty of these habitats, and um, also just the importance of them. And of course, I have to mention, this is my field assistant. He's an amazing man. He was a trishaw driver by trade, and he helped, me, um, he helped me set up camera traps one day because he saw me lugging 10 camera traps, and I was weighed down, and he jumped out and helped me. And he's been stuck with me ever since. Um, he had, I'm a very clumsy person by nature, so he has helped me not die in the field several times and drown and fall off boats and cut myself. <laughs> so I owe this man a lot. And um, I'm also proud to say that his four-year-old daughter, who is petrified of wildlife, now accompanies her father to set camera traps. She's also teaching her preschool friends and teachers and family what fishing cats are and why they're important because she's very proud of her father and the work he's doing. So thank you very much for listening to my talk. And I will hand it back over to Jim.
These are some of the other cats we're working with. Um, these particular two, Bay Cat and Flat Headed Cat, need much more work. They're in Southeast Asia. You all know what's happening in Southeast Asia. And currently, these two are IUCN Red List Endangered. No one is doing anything on them. Here are some pictures from around the world of me working with colleagues and friends, uh, having lunch in uh, Cambodia. Truck issues in China. Here's our issues in Bolivia, that people uh, kill the cats and decorate them. And in Guyana, I also had truck problems. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>